I like to thank the grace of heaven, the virtues of masters, compassion of our grand predecessor, predecessor, and all transmitters uh, for giving, and every one of you for giving me this opportunity to learn to speak in today's class on ten good acts, wholesome ways, and ten vices. Okay, so. As we all know, the cycle of rebirth is determined by karma and uh, our actions. Karma refers to the action driven by intention. Okay? And what Sanskrit calls a karma, a deed done deliberately through body, speech, or mind, which leads to future consequences. So this class is actually a continuation of a t lecture ties class, because this is how we can break the 12 legs, okay, by performing wholesome acts. So good moral actions will lead to wholesome rebirth and uh, bad moral actions will lead to unwholesome rebirth. Depends on how they contribute to the well-being of others, okay, whether it's a positive or a negative sense. For example, uh, is giving. Giving is an important source of positive karma. And intentional acts driven by disturbing emotions, uh, by volition or craving will create impressions or seeds in the mind. That is what Lecture Tai was talking about, the karmic imprints. These impressions or seeds will ripen into a future result of fruition. If we can follow the 10 wholesome acts, then we can break the chain of cause, ca uh, cause and effect that will lead to uh, rebirth in the six realms. The term, Sanskrit term, karma, karma patha in Buddhism refers to the 10 good acts or wholesome ways and the 10 vices or core unwholesome causes of action. Among these two sets, Three will be bodily, four are verbal, and three are mental. So the ten good acts are precepts or moral virtues. They, they are not commandments, okay? but it's a set of voluntary commitment or guideline to help us live a happy life without worries. And these ten good acts are supposed to prevent suffering and to weaken the effect of the three poisons of greed, anger, and ignorance. They are the basic moral instructions that uh, Sakya Muni Buddha gave to the people and the monks. Keeping each precept is a precept is said to develop uh, its opposite positive virtue. For example, abstaining from killing will develop kindness and compassion, and abstaining from stealing will develop non-attachments. Undertaking and upholding the precept is based on the principle of not to hurt other people. Compassion and a belief in karma form the foundation of these 10 good acts. So we start with the bodily actions. It's number one, to abandon killing, to abandon destroying life. So to give up killing living creatures. The Buddha stated that the taking of human or animal life will lead to negative karmic consequences. The right livelihood on, in the, eight, uh, eight, the Noble Eightfold Path include not trading in weapons or hunting or, and butchering animals. These are all considered as killing. One should always have in mind to have a compassion and loving kindness for all sentient beings, including pests and insects. So next time we see pests and insects, we cannot kill them. We cap, you know, catch them and take them outside. Including what? Mosquitoes? Yeah. I would not kill them, but it's up to you. Mm. Uh, if you don't want the mosquito to hurt somebody else or sting somebody else, then you say, I kill you, so you don't kill uh, all other people. Okay, so it's up to the individual. However, <laughs> we had a, a lecturer, lecturer Chu, uh, Chu? Yeah. she had killed uh, two, two mosquitoes and then it haunted her. She kept hearing that buzzing sound. 
okay, for a long time, until she has a uh, transmitter, so transmitter hole, to uh, bring her donations to Taiwan, and you know, so she can donate <laughs> and forward it to the mosquitoes that she killed. Yeah. So ever since then, that haunting sound ended. Okay, so it's all up to you whether you kill them or not. Okay, I wouldn't want to be haunted, so. Okay. <laughs> okay, now let's talk about war. War occurs because of craving for material resources, as well as gas, uh, grasping for political re religious views, right? So these are one's attachments to self-identity and also identification with nation, state, or religion, okay, is also another cause. So this conflict begins with, again, the three poisons of greed, anger, and ignorance. The Buddha promoted nonviolence in various ways. He encouraged uh, his, his followers not to fight in wars and not to sell or trade weapons. The Buddha stated that in a war, both the victor, the winner, and the loser will suffer. Okay, because the victor causes hatred and the defeated dwells in sorrow. The Mahayana Brahmajala Sutra states that those who take the Bodhisattva vows should not take any part in war. Watch a battle, obtain or store weapons, praise or approve killers, and aid the killing of others in any way. In his Abhidharma Kosa, which is a widely respected text written in Sanskrit in the 4th or the 5th century. Uh, this text was used by schools in Buddhism. Vasuband Vasubandhu writes that all soldiers in an army are kill guilty of killing the other army, not just those who perform the actual killing. Okay. Yeah, the common collective, collective, collective karma. karma. It isn't just the soldiers, it's also the people. Well, then, uh, yeah, then we have many, many indirect killing, okay, uh, such as uh, people that work in restaurants and people that uh, deliver meats to others, things like that, right, that we talked about a, a few months ago, and waiters, okay. Then we, we talk about abortion. Traditional Buddhism rejects abortion because it involves the deliberate destroying of a human life. And it regards human life as starting at conception. Okay. So they see that they see consciousness as present in the embryo at conception, not as developing over time. Abortion is seen as an act of killing punishable by expulsion from monastic sangha. Okay. So they state that life is there from the moment of conception and should not be disturbed for it has the right to live. And one of the reasons, yeah, that's also karma. And one of the reasons this is seen as an evil act is because human rebirth is seen as a precious and unique opportunity to do good deeds and attain liberation. So if you remember uh, the class on uh, Yulambama Festival, uh, where I was talking about Siddhigava, he, uh, during that time in July, he is guarding and protecting all the fetus and the unborn children that was killed, okay? because their spirit is wandering in this earthly realm. Okay, lost. Little, tiny, little babies. So think about that. And there are many stories of women who perform abortions are being reborn in hell because they are part of the killing of the fetus. So in the case where the mother's life is in jeopardy, Many traditional Buddhists agree that abortion is permissible because you're also saving the mother's life, okay? 
So this is the only legal permissible reason for abortion in Sri Lanka. In the case of rape, however, most Buddhists argue, argue that following an act of violence by allowing another kind of violence toward another individual is not ethical. So even though the, the baby was uh, conceived uh, by, by rape, okay, that fetus should not be killed, okay? So that is not acceptable. Aborting a fetus that is deformed is still uh, also not acceptable, not immoral, considered not immoral by most of the Buddhists, okay? Because it's still a living being. So even though it's deformed, it's deformed is because it's due to past karmas. So even though it's deformed, it still has the right to live in this physical world. Let's talk about suicide. Buddhism believes that ending one's life to escape suffering is seen as useless because one will be reborn again and again. So even though if one commits suicide, it doesn't mean that their life is going to end right there. They're going to be reborn and still continue the suffering. So one of the three forms of craving is craving for an, an I, I can't say that word, annihilation. Okay. And this form of craving is the root of future suffering. Dying with an unwholesome and agitated state of mind is seen as leading to a bad rebirth. So suicide is seen as creating negative karma. Ending one's life is also seen as throwing away the precious opportunity to generate positive karma. Holy Teacher says, if one ends their life in a suicide, one will commit suicide for seven lifetimes. Think about that, okay? In Theravada Buddhism, for a monk to even praise the advantages of dying to somebody or telling someone that, uh, oh, uh, if you, if, if after one dies, one will end up in uh, uh, a world, a blissful world, okay, this is um, giving people inspiration or motivation to, to commit suicide. So they themselves, okay, will be uh, breaching one of the highest Vinaya codes regarding the prohibition of harming life. Okay. So therefore it will, they will, uh, it will result in automatic expulsion from the Sangha. Buddhism sees that the experience of dying is a very sensitive moment in one's spiritual life because the quality of one's mind at the death time is believed to condition one's future rebirth. So when one dies, your mind has to be, uh, have good thoughts, okay? So if dying consciously without negative thoughts after, uh, you know, when you're about to die, but with joyous thoughts and good thoughts in mind, will one, trans one will have good transition into the next life. So remember that. So when that time comes, <laughs> we will remember you have to have good thoughts, yes? How about no thoughts? No thoughts is even better. <laughs> okay, but make sure it's not negative thoughts, okay? No so, thoughts. Yeah, so remember that, that's very important. Euthanasia, that is mercy killing where one brings about the death of a suffering patient uh, so as to prevent further pain is a breach of the first precept, that's killing. Okay. The argument that such a killing is an act of compassion because it prevents suffering is an unacceptable to traditional Buddhist theology because it is uh, seen to be a deeply rooted delusion. This is because the suffering being who was euthanized would just end up being reborn and having to suffer due to their karma. Therefore, mercy killing, it does not help them escape suffering. Okay. Then killing one's sick and aged parent is an act of delusion. Okay. The act of killing someone in the process of death 
also ruins the chance to mindfully experience pain and learn to let go of the body. Okay, so we cannot kill our loved ones because they're sick, okay? Choosing to be removed from life support, however, is comically neutral, okay? The choice is not to receive medical treatment when one is terminally ill is not see, seen as morally wrong. So as long as it is not because of a feeling of dislike to life. So DNR is okay, yeah. it's neutral, DNR, yeah. I do not resuscitate. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's why, like, if you, if our parents are about to, know, to leave this world and we know it, we have to ask them personally. Do you want to be resuscitated? If their answer is no, then our conscience won't bother us. So That's what we did with my dad. So we, we didn't have an opportunity to ask that question, and the person is there for a long time. Well, then you use your own judgment based on how he would feel when he was alive. Did he mention any clues? as to the fact that, oh, if I'm near death, I don't want to be resuscitated. Think about that, okay? But it's always, you know, you can even carry a conversation with them now before they pass away, okay? It, then otherwise your conscience will bother you, even though they are at their last, you know, taking their last breath. Our conscience will bother us, okay? Um, then, uh, this would also apply to not resuscitating a terminal patient. Okay, so it's comically neutral. Capital punishment. Mm -hmm. So um, Buddhism places great emphasis on the sacredness of life and therefore in theory forbids the death penalty. However, many Buddhist states do have the capital punishment. Okay. So chapter 10 of the Dhamma Dham Dhammapada, mm -hmm. okay, uh, this is a popular collection of early Buddhist poems. It states, everyone fears punishment, everyone fears death, just as you do, including sentient beings and animals, right? Therefore, do not kill or cause to kill. Everyone fears punishment. Everyone loves life as you do. Therefore, do not kill or cause to kill. And then chapter 20, 26 says, Him I call a Brahmin who has put aside weapons and renounced violence toward all creatures. He neither kills nor helps others to kill. So these sentences are interpreted by many Buddhists as an injunction against supporting any legal measure uh, that might lead to the death penalty, okay? However, um, many countries where Buddhism are practiced, okay, do practice the death it's penalty. consistent with, yeah. right, with abortion, right? So, so, you know, if you are anti-abortion, or pro-life, I call it today, then you should be pro non-capital um, non-capital punishment right isn't that right yeah. because that's consistent yeah right you, you your whole goal is to your whole principle is to preserve life right well now they have a lot of protests against abortions if you've been watching the news yeah. well, you know i don't know how far it's gonna yeah yeah. yeah yeah no but that's just the the, the, the logical yeah. the logical yeah. Yeah. carl sagan once said it best he goes you know well we are pro-life Okay. He says you should first, when, especially when he's talking to abortions, uh, not uh, people who are against abortions. What you mean is pro-human life. You're not pro-life. Yeah. You're pro-human. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Because he says, well, if you're pro-life, then I shouldn't you be a vegan. <laughs> no, yeah. that's what that's yeah. what he was trying to say. That's true. Which is true. That's, 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 that's true, true too. Yeah. Right. So I mean, he consistent. says he was telling them when he was asked the question, pro-human oh, life. Oh, yeah. no, we're pro-life because. You mean you're pro-human? Yeah, more, more subset. It's a subset. Yeah. Because, because, yeah, because you are not really pro-life. Yeah. Because you kill animals too. Killing or the same thing. Right, right. You're still killing other people. Uh, killing, yeah. Because anyway. Other life. But it's very interesting about this killing, um, because in Buddhism it doesn't pro pro uh, prohibit it. 
but you look, when you look at Confucianism, it's a little bit different. Because from the Confucian standpoint, what, sh and it's kind of hard to, to fathom sometimes, is this, when there is a need to destroy or kill, you do do that. Okay? Because Confucius says, you know, when the ministers or whatever, and they are causing people to suffer or whatever, they should be executed, for example. You know, so, so he does look at, at a different point of view. Point of view. It's, kind of, right. it's kind of interesting. Okay. So, but it really comes down to is really in what uh, the, I guess, the, the, the context that you want to put it into. Okay. So, in the case of Confucianism, yes, in this particular life, the people are causing harm to other people. Okay. Now we all say, hey, you know, even in the Tao, we say, oh, okay, <laughs> you know, we say, we say, oh, okay, you know, if you could, uh, some, some, why do some people has like a lot of merit, even though they did something small, because it influenced a lot of people, right? So if you let's say tell a president to say, oh, okay, you know, he should do good, I mean, he, he actually gains a lot of merit when he does good because this influences, you know, a lot of people, not just himself. Okay. So in that context, from the Confucian standpoint. Yeah, he's confused and says, yeah, sure. This person, this minister is a corrupt minister who blah, blah, you know, is killing his peasants or whatever, or harm, creating great harm to peasant. Yeah, he should be brought to justice and whatever. Because that is from the viewpoint of what he calls, like what we say, the five constants. He goes, there's righteousness. There's something called righteousness, you know. Because, so, but from the Buddhist standpoint, they look at it in a way, not at this particular life, but just the fact that, yeah, there's reincarnation. So it doesn't matter, you know, so, it's so, so that's why there's a reason why there's a birth, whether it's a rape or whatever you call about getting birth. Okay. And that's really one of, I don't know if you ever, ever thought about it, but why is there, you know, why, have you ever, especially for the ladies, have you ever thought about why is it that in the Tao, even in the Tao itself, okay, there's an emphasis on the chin versus the queen. Have you ever thought about that? What do you mean emphasis? Okay, emphasis in the fact that... But distinction, clear distinction. Well, not only a distinction, of course there is a distinction by the very fact that you have two, two, two categories. But why is it that there seems to be an emphasis on the chin? Meaning, the emphasis by me oh, by this, on the fact that, you know, Sure, historic in the past, you could say, oh, okay, it's culturally that always men's first. Patriarchal. Also, Patriarchal. men represent the yang. Well, yeah, right. And, and why is it that the chen the represents yang, right? Chen, right, okay. And why is it that also, when you look at when we do perform the ceremonies, okay, especially the Tao receiving ceremony, you notice that we say different things. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah, first, yeah, yeah, a little you bit. Yeah, yeah. Yes. It's a lot. Near, Near the beginning. Near the beginning. Even the beginning, no. Even, yeah, it's near the the even even the even when after you do the whole process in fact when you start the re incantation at the beginning okay and then after you made your vows it's still different and even when we get down it's different you notice yes, that yes. And also when we point out the whatever it's still different oh yeah you know, have you ever have you tried it yeah I wonder but why? I never asked why because you say wait, wait the vows the same. The point of opening that spiritual door is identical, which is true. But why is it that incantations are different? And they they say different things, and the meaning is different. In the time, in the time, not that. Yeah, have, have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about that? So, so well, take put a long story short. It's the really the fact that you know. I, I, I hate to say it because it in a way it seems very discriminatory. Yeah, very unfair. Because, because it is Bias. true that when, when you talk about karma, you know, a, go, uh, a good example that uh, I, mean, I remember uh, Zen Yas talks to me about, says, uh, you know, when we talk about, oh, you know, why does a uh, tiger kill? You know, because maybe he has to survive, right? And he goes, well, we should also ask the question, and Liu Jiang said the same thing. He goes, well, why did that? Ling or that that spirit became a tiger in the first place. You, know, you could you, you should also ask that. Okay, not just why he's a tiger because uh, by by being a tiger, he is sort of like automatically locked in the fact that yeah he has to kill to survive. 
you know, a tiger does not go plant carrots <laughs> or, or potatoes, right? He does, you can't do that. They doesn't eat potatoes or carrots. Yeah. So why is it? So and and so once you're in that situation, okay, you're locked in. You can't change it. Okay, even you could be changed through external means. In other words, somebody can raise you as a tiger but feed you yeah, vegetables. Yeah, right. yeah, but right. you yourself. The nature. The nature of it is, is when you grow up in the wild, you kill to survive. Yeah, it's almost yeah. like you say, you have no choice almost, right? Okay, so in the same way a little bit, it's the Chen and the Kun. Okay. The Kun, why is, it, why is it you are the Kun? I mean, you're the one who has to give birth, you have to go through the pains of birth, and also you have certain quote unquote biological disadvantages as some some some, some physiologists would say, you know, oh you don't have you have less upper strength, et cetera, blah blah blah. But that's beginning to change anyway <laughs> through training or whatever. <laughs> okay. But the point is is yeah, there is a in a way a um, a karmic, I'll call it karmic for now, reason why you do end up as a human versus chin. Okay. Yeah. There is some karmic association with that. There, there is, there yeah. is. Right. So, so that's why, in that sense, you know, when we talk about, you know, certain, di okay, go ahead. I was going to say that that reminds me of, um, you know, in the, in, in the, like, probably some of you have heard of an in Shonan one. That's part of the, what's that, was that? He, for heroes, the difficult, uh, gate or, or is when there's a beauty involved, when, when there's a beautiful late woman involved, it is very difficult <laughs> for the hero to go uh, to pass that test or whatever, that, 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 that temptation, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. I mean, that, that's true in history. That's true in history. Okay, yeah. I mean, but get, getting back to that, Chen and Kun is the fact that, yeah, you know, when you look at whether it's history or whatever, yes. There are many uh, indicate, uh, instances where there are great people who are Kuen. But yet, if you look at history, most of the time they are put in a place where they create a lot of problems. <laughs> like, 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 well, like you just said. <laughs> okay. yeah. They create a lot of problems. And, and, and interesting that it's culturally, <laughs> in culturally, you know, when you look at it, but that's true the throughout history, history yeah, that's yeah. written. In more that occur than you know women who are all oh, like great leaders or whatever you know, etc. And, 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 and Homer. Yeah, yeah, he was tempted. Yeah, yeah. What, what, yeah. What's, Helen what's Troy, Helen you know, Troy, right, like right, it. right, stuff yeah. like that, yeah. right? Uh, John, what? John, what? Well, John, 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 well, Mean, because well, mean okay, well, general. remember, remember yeah, the previous the class that the Kai yeah. just gave, right? So in a way, all these, you know, like these ten wholesome goods or whatever, these are in a way things to help us. When we say try to break the chain, to break the chain or whatever, is this, what it's really saying is not really per se breaking the chain, but really going against the stream, okay, going against the flow. Because the flow of us natural tendencies is to create all those things that the twelve people in the blah 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 blah, and it leads us. It get it, it, it sort of like allow causes us to devolve, to become worse and worse. What Gene now is talking about, in a way, is the thing that he said. You know, to stop us from going worse and worse, you what go against the flow. Okay. Now, because all these things that we're talking about, we're doing are nothing more. Are still what part of the mechanism of the 12 dependent virgin emissions. Because you're just doing the good part of it as opposed to the part of it. But what you're doing is the same thing. Okay. So by we call breaking it is the fact that yeah, by doing this, you then eventually come to a realization that hey, you know, you don't do the bad, but yes, you do the good, but you do the good because it gives you a karmic brighter future, if you will. Okay, and that brighter future will allow you to eventually come to the point where, oh, you have affinity with the Buddhas, etc., and then you can learn, etc., and then try to become enlightened. So, but it's interesting that yeah, some Buddhist things are different from some Confucian things. Yeah. No, no, you're, you're right. You're absolutely right. 
but, but, but there is a, because Buddhist principles, or these are principles, right? Buddhist principles, or you can say, these are really precepts, you can say yeah. precepts, right? precepts. They're looking at from one direction, one angle, one view, what, what one, perce per one perception, one point of view. Yeah. Confucius is looking at it from a different point of view. Right. Understand that? Okay, now, it's true what Master Ray mentioned that Confucius, you know, even though he didn't, you know, you know, you know he, he's part of the Tao, he taught, you know, principles, but it's true though, you know, in actual biography, I don't know if you guys know that. Did we do a Confucius biography in one of the classes? He did, you know, when he became a minister of, of the state of, uh, uh, what was that? Yeah, uh, well, what's that state? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. state. Well, it's a small state. Mm -hmm. He did order the execution of another minister. You know that, right? Yeah, it's true. In the biography, it's true. Yeah. You know, little mention. Is that we all say, oh, Confucius is so holy and whatever. Anyway, it doesn't matter. But, 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 and, and the reason for that is like what, what Minister Ray was saying. It's at the moment, at the present, right? At the present life. He's not, you know, Confucius is not thinking about all oh, the future karma and all that stuff. No, no. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, he talks about present life, present, yeah, present, right. present uh, life, yeah, present life, present, present situation. Uh, the, the, the view is you have to balance evil and what's the greater good, right? So, 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 so for him, from that perspective, you know, that minister, yes. Taking a life is bad. That's true. That's true, right? I mean, from a Buddhist perspective, Buddhist precept view, right? It, it's wrong, right? It's wrong. Even though that person's a bad person, right? Right, right? That person's a bad person. But from a Confucian point of view, it's that, okay, it's a lesser of two evil. You get it? It comes down to that hard, you know, when the rubber meets the road, right? You know, forget about, I mean, you know, these grand principles of, you know, no killing, right? Right? No killing, right? That's part of the ten either Ten Commandments or the Buddhist precept, right? Buddhist precept, you shouldn't kill, right? Isn't that true, right? Okay, which you just elaborated. But then it comes down to, well, the situation is such that it's lesser of two evils, i.e., what, what does that mean? Either you kill that person, which is one evil, we say that's one evil, or one bad immoral act from the Buddhist perspective, or you allow that evil person to harm more people, you get it? So it's a lesser of two evils. So what do you do when you are in that situation? When you are in that, you know, you can say desperate. It's like, it's like you, you're backed into a corner. There's no other alternative. You know what I'm trying to say? I mean, you can say, let it go. Yeah, but then that means you let more killing continue. Now, you can say, step back, say, well, well, well but from Buddhism point of view, from karma, that's karma. Yeah, all it's karma, karma so, yeah. which is true. True, which is true. It's, true. Not, it's not false. However, what you do to do, you know, let's say you eliminate, you know, so then it comes to the question, say, you know, you know, what ifs in history? Suppose we could kill Hitler. Suppose we could send an assassination squad and kill Hitler before even he, you know, he invaded Poland or whatever, whatever, whatever. Then wouldn't it be prevented? I mean, hindsight, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty, obviously. Then he could have prevented the mass killing of those Jews and, and cause all the world wars and all that stuff, right? Right? I mean, that, that's what if, one of the greatest what if questions, right? Okay, so, 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 I think we have to view is that, you know, sometimes at that, at this present, at this moment, see, so, so that's one of the big questions. Why did Confucius order that killing of that minister? He did, he did. I mean, that, that, that's a fact, that's a historical truth. Isn't that true? No, no, he didn't is that a, kill. No, no, he didn't kill himself. He ordered but, no, but he was a minister himself yeah, right. too. He, he ordered the, the kill, execution of another minister. Okay. Uh, under the king, yeah. Well, well, yeah. So, so you can say he's the one who instigated, right? Okay. So then, that's from a Buddhist perspective, from our, you know, principle. It's wrong. It's wrong. You can say it's immoral because because you kill somebody, you well indirectly kill somebody. Yeah. I think well, there is a principle there. That's why I started with the principle doesn't have to be fixed. It, it depends on the situation. Yeah. Right, that's, 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 that's why it's not absolute. That's why I said it depends on the situation. Depends on the situation. That's what I'm trying to say. So, so it's lesser or two evils, right? Comes down to, in this case, lesser or two evils. I'm, so I'm just saying in, that. In the case of the minister, couldn't they just remove him from office? 
I don't know. I, I don't know what the background well, story yeah, is. The conditions in, in feudal, but like I it said, was a feudal time. Time. Yeah, 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 they, time. Even if you remove somebody, yeah. you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, they still have influence, yeah, right, yeah. and they still can do yeah. things sometimes yeah, their own yeah, way. Yeah, that's that's why, yeah. like, a lot in historical China, when you look at it, in many cases, you have like dynasty dynasties, yeah. and even though there's a head figure, the king. Most of the power it's not yeah, always the among the, yeah, 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 the individual. So yeah, yeah, those different. Yeah, 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 whatever. So in other words, everybody Cliques, still had a lot groups. of power. Yeah, you know, and, and that's called court himself, intrigue. Yeah, and fortunately, <laughs> the king is just a figure yeah. most of the time. And not also, all the time, most of the time. Depends on his advisors right, too, right? right? I mean, so, they're so bad you know, apples. Whoa. <laughs> the king can say, "Oh, I remove you." Yeah, you know, yeah, and the guy can say, "So what? Okay, I still can do that." Yeah, See, that's the problem. And Confucius is trying to, in a way, stop that. So, so, so you could say argue that Confucius did create a karma by having that evil, you know, that that minister executed. But he, it, it, it's like you have no other choice. That's what I'm trying to say. So in the future, yeah, there will be other karma result of that. That's true. But at least for the present, you did save life. It's like saying, you know, vows. It, it, uh, we we go to another thing. Vows, right? Mm -hmm. We all took, I mean, the Buddhists, you know, monks have vegan vows, right? Or whatever vows, right? So they're in history, right? There are a lot of people, you know, who, who were forced to eat meat, you know that? In order to save a city, a village, or whatever, his, his monastery, or whatever. No, there, 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 there are stories about that. Do you guys know that? Yeah. So then, I mean, by definition, right, the principle, the, 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 the Abhidhamma, the precept is that if you break your vow, you're going to go to hell. Right? I mean, I mean, you know, I don't care. You know, you're going to go to hell. So in that case, I don't think so. Because he had to, he, he did it to save others. I mean, so he, he's willing to sacrifice, break his own vow, right? I mean, and maybe, you know, suffer the consequences or whatever consequences in order to save, right? That's, that's how virtues are being shocked. Right, right. Yeah, so you can't, I mean, right. That's why it's not rigid, right? It's not fixed. Goals in isolation. Mm -hmm. because there's also, you know, merit that offset karma, right? So, so by killing the person, maybe you have greater merit. Because, right, you save people, you're right? You save people, right, right. Yeah, right. So it's, it's not that clear cut. It's right, like, oh, it's, right. It's, it's not it's black and white. That's the key. Yeah, right. Actually, that I, I remember um, uh, Buddha's scripture on like once we have the mer uh, virtues, then then these uh, that are um, collectors, they they actually they kind of also kind of um, will let go of. No, it will be easier on you, right? Be easier. Um, yeah. They won't, yeah. they they they, am yeah. they also admire people with virtues. So the key is. Precepts are precepts, fine. But like you said, we should not take it in isolation. We have to what? Harmonize it with the conditions and apply our wisdom. That's, didn't I say that in six pyramids? <laughs> so, anyway, right? Because there's precepts, right? Number two, isn't that number two? Second pyramid is precepts? Right, right, right? Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah, that's sorry. okay. No, no, Keep talking. This, see, everything's connected. Everything's connected. Everything's connected. <laughs> Keep talking. <laughs> okay, Gene. Okay. So now we're up to animals and the environment. Okay. So Buddhism does not see humans as being in a special moral category over animals or as having any kind of God given dominion over them. So humans are seen as being more able to make moral choices and this means that they should protect and be kind to animals who are also suffering beings living in samsara. Buddhism also sees humans as part of the nature, not as separate from it. So uh, to summarize, uh, the, from the Buddhist point of view uh, of harmony with nature, we classify other animals and living beings as nature acting as if we ourselves are not part of it. Then we pose the question, how should we deal with nature? We should deal with nature the way we should deal with ourselves. We should not harm ourselves. We should not harm nature. Human beings and natures are inseparable. Okay. Now, vegetarianism. Buddhism focuses mainly on direct participate, participation in the destruction of life. So this includes hunting, butchering, fishing, and 
trading in flesh um, as professions. So also ordering or encouraging someone to kill an animal for you. One of the noble eightfold paths are proper livelihood. These, this means that we do not work in a profession that would harm sentient beings. And that includes raising animals for slaughtering, working in slaughterhouses, or drivers who transport animals to be slaughtered, selling and manufacturing weapons, um, exterminating, and pesticides. These are harming sentient beings, and it's considered as killing. Okay, so Buddha says, if one can give up taking life, then one can accomplish 10 ways of being free from vexations. Okay, one gives universally to all beings without fear. One always has a heart of great compassion towards all beings. All habitual tendencies of hate in oneself will be cut off forever. One's body is always free from illness. One's life is long. One is constantly protected by non-human beings. One is always without bad dreams. One sleeps and wakes happily. The entanglement of enmity is eradicated and one is free from all hatred. One is free from the dread of evil destinies. And last, when one's life comes to an end, will be reborn as a diva. You see all the benefits for not killing? <laughs> then the second one is to abandon stealing. Okay, so what is considered as stealing according to Sakyamuni Buddha? If it is not yours, do not take it. Okay. So do not take anything that doesn't belong to us. This is also measured by the intent of the person taking it. If a person takes something that doesn't belong to them with the intention of stealing, then it is considered as stealing. So everything depends on the intention. If we want to have that particular object, asking is always a nice way to establish possession. Then any intentional act to take an object against one's wish, uh, against the wishes of the owner would be theft. So if we don't ask and we just take it, okay, without the owner knowing it or approving it, that is considered as stealing. Unless if someone is happy with us taking something, mm. then that would not be stealing, that would be a gift, okay? So in today's world, robbing a bank, <laughs> shoplifting, <laughs> hacking into other people's computers to get personal information, scam calls pretending to be the IRS or the social security to trick people into sending them money, okay? Credit card, card, credit card frauds, identity theft, these are all considered as stealing, okay? It's the modern world stealing. <laughs> So even uh, as I mentioned in my class a couple of weeks ago, Holy Teacher has said that we should not take company time to do personal errands or make personal costs. This is also considered, okay, not taking something without the boss approving. Well, so, if the boss approves it, then if it, yeah, then then you can do it. You can ask yeah. for permission. Yeah. Can I make a personal call or can I run an errand? But if the boss doesn't know and you sneakily run off for half an hour, okay, and they sneak back in, so that's you have to ask. Yeah. yeah. So always ask first, okay. So also taking company pens and paper and whatnot to for home use is also considered oh, stealing. Unless your boss approves, that's so different. What if you can reach the boss and you just tell one of your co-workers that I'm going to post it? Then you ask for your manager's approval. Okay? Make up the time later. Yeah. Okay. So always ask. So we have to think before we act. Always be careful about that. Ask yourself, does this belong to me? If the answer is no, do not take it. That also includes uh, the things in the temple because everything in here belongs to God. So whatever we take, it's also considered as taking something that doesn't belong to us, including what? Holy water. Mm -hmm. Get permission. Get per Even though you say, oh, it's just water. It's not just water. It's holy water, okay? It took a lot of time to accumulate. 
and it's God's water. So always ask for permission. Okay. Now, a good example to follow is Immortal Lu, who, who is the, uh, go- one of the four guardians of law. When he was uh, uh, digging in his farm, he found a, a bag of precious gold, nuggets, or whatever it was. So did he take it? No. He put it back and buried it in the exact same spot because he's hoping whoever buried this is the owner. Where did they come back for it? Okay, and then they find that it's gone, right? So that's a very good example to follow. If it, yes. I'm sorry, that was one of the 10 tests that he went through. Yes, yes, yeah, and he passed yeah, with flying oh, colors. Remember, we will, oh. we will also be tested, okay? There's always a set of eyes looking at us. If it doesn't belong to us, don't take it. Then the Buddha says, if one gives up stealing, one will attain 10 kinds of dharmas, which can protect one's confidence. One's wealth will increase and accumulate and cannot be scattered and destroyed by kings, robbers, floods, fires, or careless sons. One is thought of with fondness by many people. People will not take advantage of you. You will be praised everywhere. One is above the worry that oneself could be injured. Okay, so that's the benefits of not stealing. Oh, there's more. One's good name spreads. One is without fear in public. One is endowed with wealth, long life, strength, peace, happiness, and skill in speech without deficiencies. One always think of giving. At the end of one's life, well, one will reborn as a diva. So even though you give up stealing, you will also be what rewarded with wealth. Think about that. Is this the end or is there a ceremony? Oh, okay. Okay. So number three is abandoning wrong conduct in regard to sense pleasure. In other words, to give up sen- sen- sexual misconduct. One is to refrain from sexual misconduct. This entails any sexual con- con- conduct which is harmful to others, such as rape, molestation, and adultery. Having affairs outside of marriage is a sexual misconduct. Monks and nuns of most traditions are not expected to refrain from uh, all not only expected to refrain from sexual activity, but also must take vows for celibacy. So once this vow is taken, one must fulfill it. Okay. So Buddha identifies craving as the cause of suffering. And he identifies three objects of craving. The craving for existence, the craving for non-existence, and the craving for sense pleasures. So Buddha explains that craving for sexual pleasure is a cause of suffering. Therefore, always be mindful that we should avoid uh, sensual desires to letting them go. So in the Buddha's view, this is a rule of training. Okay, so keep that in mind. Do not say, oh, forget about it. I am not coming back to the temple. Okay, please do not do that. So keep that in mind that this is not a commandment from God, the Buddha, or anyone else. This is just a guideline, some uh, a precept for us to follow. If you think that this is wonderful and I can follow it, then be sincere in following. However, if you think, oh, this is impossible, I cannot do it, you just try your best. That's all. Okay. Don't think, oh, forget about it. I'm not coming back to the temple because of this. Who's going to be suffering? You and all your ancestors and your descendants. Okay? So this is just a guideline for you. The most common formulation of Buddhist ethics are the five precepts. What are the five precepts? Killing, stealing, uh, lust, uh, lying, and intoxicants, yeah, okay. So, and also the Noble Eightfold Path, which say that one should neither be attached to nor crave sensual pleasure. 
These precepts take the form of voluntary personal undertaking, and it's not a divine mantra or instruction. Mandate. Mandate, I'm sorry. Mandate or instruction. Okay. So the Buddha's teachings arise out of a wish for others to be free from dukkha, which is suffering. Free from suffering involves freedom from sexual desires, and the training to get rid of the craving involves to a great extent abstaining from those desires. And Buddha says, if one can give up wrong conduct, one will attain four kinds of dharmas which are praised by the wise. All one's faculties are tuned and adjusted. They are all harmonized. One is free from turmoil and excitement. One is praised by the world. And one's wife cannot be uh, encroached or violated upon any, by anybody. Okay, the second is the verbal actions. And that will consist of four verbal actions. Right speech is to abstain from lying, from div divisive speech, from a, how do you say that? Divisive. Oh, divisive speech, from abusive speech, and from idle chatter. Words alone can start wars and get people killed. Having the right speech is very important moral virtue. There are five keys to the right speech. It is spoken at the right time, spoken in truth, spoken affectionately and spoken beneficially and it is spoken of goodwill and buddha says if we can abandon from lying from divisive speech from abusive speech and from idle chatter then we can purify ourselves through well chosen speech okay the fourth is abandoning false speech oh this should be oh the numbers are wrong I'm sorry, computer typographical error. <laughs> My error. <laughs> Number one is to abandon false speech, to give up lying. Do not lie for the sake of themselves or another, or for some trivial worldly reason. Words spoken with the intent of misrepresenting the truth is considered lying. Telling a deliberate lie is an evil deed. The danger, is in, the danger in lying is that when a person is to lie, there is no evil deed that they may not do. So lying to, to us sounds like, oh, it's just a little white lie. But if one can lie, they can do anything. Okay. So words spoken with the intent of misrepresenting the truth, telling a, del oh, I already said that. The danger in, when one continues to lie, they will believe in their own lies. Okay. So if you lie so much, you, you won't be able to tell the difference between a true lie and the truth, okay? Because you get so used to lying. So always be honest in our speech. Buddha says, if one, oh, that was number four. <laughs> what happened to my? I think your number system is uh, Okay, 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 yeah, my numbers are all wrong. Okay, this is supposed to go later, okay. Go to number five. <laughs> That's the second one. Abandoning slanderous or divisive speech, that is malicious, insulting speech. Sometimes we want to hurt somebody and we say evil words and hurtful things to them, okay? And that is called slander, divisive speech. Words spoken with intent of creating rifts between people. One does not repeat what they heard so as to divide people against each other. So in other words, if somebody else comes to us and say, oh, this and this is, okay, this and this person is so bad, and da, 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 da. And then you, you go back to that other person and say, do you know what so-and-so said about you? Okay, that is a divisive speech is to divide the friendship among two people. That is horrible. That is gossiping. Okay. That is very evil. Yeah, yeah, fork, yeah. That's super evil. Yes, okay. If that happens, we keep our mouth shut. Okay, we don't tell nobody what the other person said. Okay? So, you know, instead of agreeing with that person, you can say, oh, that's not what that person means. You know, try to make excuses so that person does not feel that way about the other person. In other words, 
don't cause a rift, but to mend the friendship. It, it happens a lot at the workplace. Oh, it happens all over the place. <laughs> Not even in the temple it happens. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay? Oh, yeah. Many, many times oh, yeah. in the oh, yeah. temple. Oh, yeah. Okay? Okay. Many, many, millions this of is times. Just so bad. Okay. You gotta be careful. What? Yeah, that's very malicious. Very malicious. Sometimes um, it's non intentional, but unfortunately, you know, it, it, it could be misinterpreted, and that's the problem. Yes, yeah. yes. And also, if two people are very good friends with each other, you can go and tell one other person, oh, that person is so evil, you shouldn't be friends with that person. That's causing a rift also. Okay. Oh. That you were basically jealous jealousy or envy because of their friendship <laughs> that's very very bad okay so instead okay so uh, instead which instead of dividing people among you know their friendship with their friendship we should support unity delight in harmony loving harmony speaking words that can promote harmony Okay, and then number don't don't go there yet. Number six. Oh, okay. So Buddha says, if one can give up slandering, one will then attain the five kinds of incorruptible dharmas. One attains an incorruptible body because no harm can, no one can harm it. One gets an incorruptible family because no one can destroy it. One attains incorruptible confidence because this is in line with one's own actions. One attains to an incorruptible spiritual life because one cultivates, uh, it, one's cultivation is firmly grounded. One gets incorruptible spiritual friends because one does not mislead or delude anybody. Okay, and oh, and I skipped the the other one with the lying. So the Buddha says, if one gives up lying, then one can attain the eight dharmas which are praised by the devas. One's mouth is always pure and has the, that's, uh, that's, four, that's four. Yeah. yeah, yeah, go down a little bit. No, go up a little bit. <laughs> go down, I, I don't remember, you find it. Yeah, right there. So one's mouth is always pure and has the fragrance of a blue lotus flower. One is I don't know what blue lotus flowers. No, no, no. Why is it blue? I have no idea. No, it just means it's red. It's yeah. Oh yeah. right, that's true. Yeah, it means right. One is trusted and obeyed by the world. What one says is true, and one is loved by many, uh, by men and divas. One will always comfort beings with loving words. One attains to excellent bliss of mind, and one's actions, speech, and thoughts are pure. One's speech is faultless, and one's mind is always joyful. One's words are respected and, and are always followed by men and divas. One's wisdom is extraordinary and cannot be subdued. That's to end lying. Okay? Now, let's go to abandoning harsh speech. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Harsh speech. Words spoken with intent of hurting another person. That is harsh speech. So we must speak in a way that's mellow, pleasing to the ear, polite, likable, and agreeable to the people. The Buddha said if one give up harsh language, then one will attain to the accompli accomplishments of eight kinds of pure actions. One speech is meaningful and reasonable. All that one says is profitable for others. One's words are bound to be truthful. One's language is beautiful and marvelous. One's words are acceptable by others. One's words are trusted. One's words cannot be ridiculed. One's words are being loved and enjoyed. Number seven, abandoning idle chatter. That means to give up talking nonsense. Words spoken with no purposeful in, intent at all. That's idle chatter. One's words should be timely, true, and meaningful, in line with the teaching and training. To say things at the right time, which are valuable, reasonable, to the point, and beneficial. So idle chatter would include words spoken at the wrong time, that's inappropriate to the occasion, Words that contain untrue, untruth or exaggeration instead of present true information. 
you know, some people talk with exaggeration. If it's not that serious, they make it, they blow it up. And that's like a drama queen or a drama king, right? D-I-V-A. D-I-V-A diva, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, it, yeah, and words that bring no benefit, not self-display meaningless topics instead of use profitable words. Words that lead the listener to unwholesome thoughts and conduct, not words that develop greed. Instead, words which lead to wholesome thoughts, okay. Words that threaten the listener's self-discipline. So words that persuade people to break rules and undisciplined actions. What's what's corny, man? Come on, Jay. What's corny? Huh? What's corny? Corny. 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 Yeah, corny. Uh, <laughs> words that express corny and shallow ideas, like corny, like it, that. That is so stupid. Not that meaningful. Is, yeah, not yeah. meaningful. Not useful. Yeah. Not yeah. beneficial. Yeah, not beneficial. Okay. That's what corny means. Yeah. Uh, so the words that lack originality, okay, is considered corny. Deb and Deb instead of important views and ideas. These are all idle chatter, okay. So the focus is on the intent. Before we speak, we focus on why we want to speak. We filter through our mind what we will say before we say it. As a result, we become more aware of ourselves, more honest with ourselves, more firm with ourselves. We also save ourselves from saying things that we will regret later. And Sakyamuni Buddha said, well, said, when his disciples meet, they do either two things, either discuss the Dharma or maintain noble silence. <laughs> Okay. Either you talk about the Dharma, or you keep your mouth shut. That's, what you're <laughs> That's pretty strict. <laughs> you cannot say about anything else. That's That's strict. Strict. No joking <laughs> around, nothing. You can't ask about the weather. Yeah, but that's the no. no, no idle chat. No, no idle chat. No idle chat. No Not call, asking call, about, call. oh, how was your weekend? Yeah. Nothing yeah. like that. That's very <laughs> strict. strict. Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, the Buddha's scripture also said um, to to focus on propagating Tao. Yeah, yeah. Okay, only Tao, nothing else. That's what the monk do, they don't speak. Yeah, and, uh, and the Buddha says, speak concisely with as few words as necessary. <laughs> Condensed or whatever you were trying to relate to. One should speak only words which one would not torment oneself, nor harm others. One should speak only with pleasant words, which are acceptable to others. Words that are soothing to the ear, that are affectionate, that to the heart, that are polite, appealing, and pleasing to the people. So Sakyamuni Buddha says, reflect on your speech before, during, and after. So before you are about to speak, the Buddha says to his son, Rahula. Is that how you say it, Rahula? Yeah, no, Rahula. Okay. When he says to his son, whenever you want to perform a verbal act, you should reflect on it. This verbal act I want to perform, would it lead to self-affliction, to affliction to other people, or to both? If it is an unskillful, is it an unskillful verbal act with painful consequences, painful results? So if the answer is yes, it would, uh, it is better not to say it, okay? But if the answer is no from the reflection, it would be a skillful verbal action with ha happy consequences, happy results, then you should say it. Now during the verbal act, he says, while we're speaking, we should also reflect. The same question, is this going to be self-affliction or self-affliction to others or, or affliction to others or both? If it, is, if it is, then you should stop talking, okay? Or if it's not, then you sh can continue. After is the same question, okay? If it is, then you, uh, if, if it is, then you should not have said it and you should repent for saying it. Okay, but if it 
isn't, then you should be happy that you said it. Okay? So always reflect. Constant self-reflection on a daily basis is a must for a cultivator. This is how we can improve ourselves. It can. This is how we can stop uh, causing this is from my own. This is how we can stop causing karma. This is how we can um, we can recognize our faults and improve on ourselves in our cultivation. Self-reflect every day. The Buddha says, if one can abandon frivolous speech then one will attain to the accomplishment of three certainties. One is certain to be loved by the wise. One is certain to be able to answer questions with wisdom and according to reality. One is certain to have the most high, excellent dignity and virtue among men and divas. And one is without falsehood. Okay. Number three is mental actions. Mental action consists of three things. Three poisons. Three, po yeah. Number eight is to abandon covetousness. covetousness. Okay, I can't finish. I'm sorry. End of class. Thank you. If I said anything wrong or if I did not cover this topic well enough, I ask uh, God and the Buddhas for their forgiveness. Thank you.